Now consider the scenario where a surprise test has been taken for the students and instead of a total marks of 10, the total marks in this case is 50. So as you can see, a pretty large amount of data has been considered over here. Now to draw a simple frequency distribution table will be quite inconvenient to represent the individual marks that has been obtained. It will be tedious for the teacher. So under such circumstances, it is usually wiser to group this data. That is, I can group this data into small groups like marks from 0 to 10 and then marks obtained from 11 to 20 onwards 21 to 30 and so on. So when I'm grouping data into small groups like this, it becomes easier for me as well as the teacher to represent this particular data. Thus, these groupings are known as classes or in other words, we can say that the entire data set that has been given to us has been grouped into five classes. What are these classes? These classes are 1 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 40, and then 41 to 50. So data has been grouped under five classes. Now over here you will see that each class contains two numbers to represent it. The lower number is known as the lower limit of the class and the upper number is known as the upper limit of the class. So for class 1 to 10, 1 is the lower limit and 10 is the upper limit. For class 11 to 20, 11 is the lower limit whereas 20 is the upper limit. Another term is defined when it comes to classes. That is the class size or class width. Over here, how can we define the class size or class width? It will be defined as the lower class limit minus the lower class limit of the previous class. Similarly, if I am to define the class size with the help of any two other classes, let's say this class and this class, it will be obtained in the same way. The lower class limit minus the lower class limit of the previous class. So it will be 11 minus 1 which is equal to 10 or in this case 31 minus 21 which is equal to 10. It can also be found out in another manner that is the upper class limit minus the upper class limit of the previous class. So over here it will be 20 minus 10 which is again equal to 10 and this will be true for any two consecutive classes we consider. So the class size or class width is given by the difference in between the lower limit of one class and the lower limit of the previous class or the upper limit of one class minus the upper limit of the previous class. So now I have to represent this particular data that we have with the help of a grouped frequency distribution table. If you remember earlier, we had a simple frequency distribution table where individual variates were given their frequency. Now in this case, to make matters easier, we have a grouped frequency distribution table. So as you can see, we do not have to list down every individual variate. Instead, I just list the groups that I have considered or the classes that I have considered. So let us see how we can fill up this table. So what is the first mark that has been obtained by the student? It is 48. Where in these classes do you think 48 will lie? As you can see, obviously, that 48 will lie in between 41 and 50. So over here, I place one vertical mark. Now let's see, 42. Where will 42 lie? Again, 42 will lie within 41 and 50. So I place another vertical line in tally marks. Moving on, we have 38. 38 will lie in between 31 and 40. So I place one vertical mark. Then I have 37. 
37 will again lie within 31 and 40. So I place another vertical mark. Then I have 25 and 23. 25 and 23 both lie within 21 and 30. So I place two vertical marks. So in this way, I move forward and draw the tally marks for the respective classes. And then from the tally marks, I can directly tell the frequency. Thus, over here, I obtain the tally marks, as you can see. Now, if you look closely, it is very easy to say what the frequency corresponding to the tally marks is. For the first case, the frequency is 3. For the second case, the frequency is 5. Because if you recall, four vertical lines crossed by a slanted line represents 5. In the third case, the frequency is 6. In the fourth case, the frequency is 8. And in the last case, the frequency is 3. So thus, we have obtained the grouped frequency distribution table. Now the teacher faced a slight problem. There was a student who was absent on the day of the surprise test. So this student was asked to take the test later on by the teacher. Now the student obtained the marks out of 50, that was 20.5. The student obtained 20.5 out of 50. Now if you look closely at the classes that we have considered, where do you think we will fit in 20.5? We cannot fit it into 11 to 20 because 20.5 20 is greater than 20. Neither can we fit it into 21 to 30. Why? Because 20.5 20 is lesser than 21. So what do we do? In this case, we need to obtain continuous classes and to convert these classes, which are known as discrete classes, into continuous classes, we need to do something which is known as adjustment. How can this adjustment be done? With the help of an adjustment factor. So let us see what the adjustment factor is. The adjustment factor mathematically is given by the lower limit of one class minus the upper limit of the previous class whole divided by two. That is half of the lower limit of one class minus upper limit of previous class. So over here, if you have to find out the adjustment factor, we consider any two consecutive classes. So I consider these two classes. What is the lower limit of this class? 21. And the upper limit of the previous class, that is 20. So 21 minus 20 divided by 2, which will give me half or 0.5. So the adjustment factor is 0.5. If you will notice closely, if I consider any two other consecutive classes, I will come up with an adjustment factor that is equal to 0.5. So let's say I consider these two classes. In this case, the lower limit of the higher class is 31, and the upper limit of the previous class is 30. So 31 minus 30 divided by 2, which is again half, which is nothing but 0.5. So the adjustment factor in order to convert these discrete classes to continuous classes is 0.5. So now let us find how we can use the adjustment factor. The adjustment factor firstly is applied to the first class. How? From the first class, we deduct 0.5 from the lower class limit and add 0.5 to the upper class limit. So we have 1 minus 0.5, that is the lower class limit minus 0.5, the lower class limit that is 1 minus 0.5, 2, 10 plus 0.5, that is the upper class limit plus 0.5. So after adjustment, what will this class look like? It will be 0.5. 10.5. In a similar manner, if I proceed with the rest of the classes, let's see what I obtain. For the second class, I will obtain 11 minus 0.5, 9 
that is 10.5 to 20 plus 0.5 that is 20.5 and in a similar manner for the rest of the classes 20.5 to 30.5 30.5 to 40.5 40.5 now here's an interesting twist over here if you notice closely I have been adding 0.5 to the upper limits of the classes but when you reach the last class always remember that you will subtract 0.5 from the lower class limit however you will not add 0.5 to the upper class limit why because the test has been conducted on a maximum mark of 50. So in no way should this exceed 50. So if I add 50 plus 0.5, that is if I add 0.5 to 50, it will be exceeding 50. And in order to avoid that, I will not add 0.5 to the upper class limit of the last class. So now I have obtained the classes after adjustment. And as you can see, these classes are continuous classes. Because if I take two consecutive classes, the lower class limit of one is equal to the upper class limit of the previous one. So now, where do you think I can fit in 20.5? Should 20.5 belong to the second class? Or should 20.5 belong to the third class? Conventionally, 20.5 is taken to be in the third class. So if we have a particular number that is equal to the lower limit of a class as well as the upper limit of the previous class, conventionally we place that number where it is equal to the lower limit. So 20.5 conventionally is placed in class number 3. And thus we have obtained classes after adjustment and this is the continuous frequency distribution table which is also as you can see grouped. So now we have another instance. Over here we have been given some data. Let's see what that data is. 30 children were asked about the number of hours they watched TV in the previous week. So I have 30 observations from 30 children and the results are as you can see 1, 6, 2, 3, 5, 12 and so on. So each variate, that is each occurrence of the variable corresponds to the number of hours that a particular child watched TV in the previous week. And I have been asked to do two things. Firstly, I have been asked to find out the range. Secondly, I have to decide about the number of classes to represent this large amount of data and the class size. So let's see how we go about doing that. First thing to do is to arrange the given data in some particular format. So over here, I convert the raw data into array data. Once I convert it into array data, it means I have arranged it in some particular format. So over here, it has been arranged in ascending order. That is from the least value to the highest value. So now it will be very easy to find out the range what is the range? The range is nothing but the maximum value of the observations minus the minimum value of the observations. So it will be 17, that is the maximum, minus 1, that is the minimum. So the range is nothing but 17 minus 1 equals to 16. Now I have to find out and decide about the number of classes to take and class size. So usually what happens is we don't consider many classes. We consider minimum number of classes so as to keep the number of classes less. So in this case we have 30 observations. So I will consider a class size of 5 and number of classes 4. So class size 5 will mean 0 to 5 then 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20. Now why do I consider only 4 classes? As you can see over here that 
no particular observation is exceeding 20. And thus, if I consider four classes of class size 5, I can easily and conveniently represent the given data. Thus, I consider four classes which has class size 5, and the classes which I previously mentioned are 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, and 15 to 20. So in a similar manner that I explained previously, we can find out the grouped frequency distribution table. That is in this case continuous. So again, for 0 to 5, we find out how many variates there are. And accordingly, we place the tally marks. For every class, we place the tally marks. And from that directly, we can tell what the frequency is. So as you can see, we have the group frequency distribution table for this data. For the first case, since we have four vertical lines crossed by a slanted line in two instances, again, four vertical lines crossed by a slanted line, each of these represents five. So 5 plus 5 gives me 10. So I have the frequency 10. In the second case, I have 5 plus 5 plus 3. So that gives me 13. And in a similar manner, the rest is found out. So as you can see, it is pretty simple. Now let us talk about another very important concept. This concept is of cumulative frequency. Now firstly, let us define cumulative frequency. Cumulative frequency is the sum of frequencies of all the previous classes and that particular class. So it might seem a little bit abstract to you. So without further ado, let me clear it out. So let me consider the first class. What will be the cumulative frequency? That frequency plus the frequencies of all previous classes. Now as you can see, for the first class, there are no previous classes. So the cumulative frequency for the first class will be 10. That is the same as its frequency. Now what happens for the second class? When I'm considering the second class, I will have to consider its frequency plus the frequency of all previous classes. That is the cumulative frequency of previous classes. So the cumulative frequency of the previous class is 10 and the frequency of this class is 13. So 13 plus 10 is going to give me 23. So the cumulative frequency till the second class is 23. Similarly, for the third class, what will I do? I will add the frequency of that class with the cumulative frequency till the previous class. So it will be 5 plus 23, which is equal to 28. And for the last class, it will be 2 plus 28, which is equal to 30. Now, if you recall, the original observations were 30 in number. Or in other words, 30 children had been asked about the number of hours they watched television in the previous week. So the final row of cumulative frequency gives us the total number of observations. Now, let me tell you how cumulative frequency is an important concept. Cumulative frequency is important if, let's say, you are asked to find out the number of children who watch television for at most 10 hours. That is, from 0 to 10, but not more. But from the classes, if you see, you can only have 0 to 5 and 5 to 10. So how will you tell how many children watch TV from 0 to 10 hours? Very simple. You consider the cumulative frequency starting from 0 and ending at 10. And that cumulative frequency is 23. So we can directly say from cumulative frequency that 23 children watch TV for at most 10 hours, but not more. In a similar manner, we can also say how many children watch television for at most 15 hours in the previous week. The answer will be 28. So in this way, cumulative frequency is very helpful. And we shall also find out its use later on in certain other concepts.